streets underwater Y'all know what's going on. It's time for another episode of Doing Time with Joe. I'm your host, Joe Baker. Welcome to the show, y'all. Look here, Chris wants to come clean. He's real close to the BM, and he wants to tell him what he did, the mistake that he made years and years ago uh, when he was uh, influenced by Sean at a time when he was really looking for uh, that male role model, that male father figure in his life. Sean manipulated his mind and manipulated his heart and convinced him to become a vice lord so that he could gather information for the vice lord organization that's located on the north side of town. And now that Chris has found his father and he looks up to the BM like another father, he wants to be honest with him. He wants to come clean, but he's afraid because Pam's brother, you know what I'm saying, that... uh, is <laughs> he that hit man, he that goon, you know what I'm saying? He's afraid that he's going to have to end up facing whatever consequences that he wants to dish out. Plus, he's afraid that he's going to lose his relationship with Pam, the girl that he's fallen in love with, the girl that he believes he wants to spend the rest of his life with, and he most definitely doesn't want to disappoint uh, B- the BM. He really admires this man, and he don't want to disappoint him. And all the people that he's gotten to know and become friends with, and the gangsters, he don't want to lose them. He likes where he lives. He likes all this. And all of these things are in jeopardy because once he says these things, he doesn't know what the outcome is going to be. So he's been talking this over with his moms and pops, you know what I'm saying, especially when he calls his pops. And now his pops has come down for his 17th birthday, and he decides upon to take it upon himself to go talk to the BM in confidence. And when he pulls the BM to the side and they're talking, first they catch up on some things in life, you know what I'm saying? And he makes he makes it understood to the BM and the other old head gangsters that that he's meeting with and sitting out and talking with that he's going to repay the money. He has the money in the bank. He's going to make sure that he gets it to him next week. And they're cool with that. You know, the, the bygones are bygones and they're moving on. But besides, it's not too many old head gangsters left to even remember what he did. The younger ones have no clue as to what went on. So anyway, all of that issue is settled. The debt is settled. But now he has a favor to ask the BM, and it's going to get tricky. It's going to get tricky. So he tells him, he says, there's something I need to tell you about my son, Chris, that you may get upset about, but it's something that I'm going to need your help in fixing. So the BM tells him, he said, anything for little Chris, anything that he needs, he's going to get it from me. He said, I hope you mean that. I hope you mean that because he made a mistake when he was 13 that is going to uh, make you question and second guess what you just said. So the BM tells me, he said, come on out with it. Tell me what it is that Chris did that would make me upset with him. And he said, I got to have your word that you won't repeat this, you will not repeat this, and that you hold this in confidence. And he told him, he said, look, if it's, a, if it's something that affects me individually, I'll do that. But if it's something that affects the organization, he said, we got to talk. We got to talk because I can't withhold that, whatever it may be, from the organization if it's going to affect the organization, unless it's something that we can handle. He said, well, whatever it is, when I get ready to tell you, he said, we're going to just have to handle it then. And the BM had never heard Chris's pops talks like that, but he understood where he was coming from. He said, well, if it's something we can handle, then we're going to handle it. It's as simple as that. He said, now come on out with it. What is it? He said, Chris is a vice lord. So the BM looked at him. He says, no, he's not a vice lord. He's a gangster. He said, no, he was a gangster after he became a vice lord. He became a vice lord because he got manipulated by this guy named Sean that lives on the north side. He said, do you remember Miss Kathy? So the BM was like, yeah, I remember how you, she had a son. She had a son and her son uh, manipulated Chris a few summers back into becoming a vice lord when he was 13 so that he could gather information on what's going on with the gangster organization and send it back to him. He said, what was he doing all this for? Who sanctioned it? 
And he said, I don't know. Chris doesn't know. He said, well, in order for him to do that, something like that, he would have to have permission from the top. So Chris's pops looked at him. He said, look, you know, I don't get into any of that kind of stuff. I don't understand any of that. He said, but at the end of the day, I don't know if he had permission from the top or not. All I do know is that he wants to come clean tonight to you because he respects you so much. He can't hold it anymore. And he loves being a gangster, which I disagree with. But he cannot hold this anymore. So the BM is looking at him and he's telling him, he said, okay, if he says these things, consequences have to be paid. He said, I understand that, but don't kill my son. He said, I would never allow anything to happen to him like that. But if he wants to come clean and put it all on the table, he's got to put it all on the table and then we'll figure out a way to deal with this. But I don't think he should be coming clean to the family. He needs to do that with me. And then we'll figure out what to do. So the BM and Chris's pops, they go back to the house. And Chris can tell the BM it's different. He's acting different. He's got this look on his face of disappointment. So they all go into the kitchen and Lisa comes into the kitchen. She says, what's going on? Y'all want something to eat? So Chris's pops tells her, nah, we're good. We just got some things to discuss. She said, is it about Chris? And he looks at her and he says, yes. Yeah. She said, well, I'm staying. So they start talking about the situation and they tell Chris, tell him. Tell him. He's got to hear it out of your mouth. So Chris is standing in front of him and the BM is looking at him. He said, tell me. He said, and tell me everything. Don't hold anything back. So Chris starts to tell him when he went to spend time on the north side, the summer that he went and what happened and the whole conversation that he had with Sean about becoming a vice lord, when he became a vice lord and everything that that entails and why he was uh, doing the things that he was doing. So the BM asked me, he said, did you report back anything to them? He's like, yeah. He said, I told him when I met you, I told him when I became uh, uh, all the different things when I became a gangster. I told him when you put me in position to where I would just be dropping off a pack or two here and there. And Chris's pops and moms is listening to this and they are really pissed at all the things that have been going on that they had no knowledge about, but she was suspect about but it wasn't time to get into those issues. So when Chris finished, he stood there sweating, not knowing what was going to happen. And the BM, he's sitting there at the table and he's looking at Chris with this studious look on his face. And he's trying to figure out what to do. And he tells Chris, he said, okay, we can do something about this, but there's one problem. He said, I don't know how much, I don't know how much of this is known to the top people in vice law. He said, because if they knew this, if they knew this and they sanctioned it, they would be asking for a war. And he said, everything that we've been doing over the last few years was about, they stay there, we stay here. He said, so I doubt that they know this. I doubt that they know this. And if they don't know this, then Sean is in trouble. Sean is in trouble. He said, so what we got to find out, what we have to find out is if anybody knows this, if anybody else in Vice Lord knows this, because if they do, we're going to war. And Chris, it's not going to look good for you. But if they don't, then this is on Sean and they'll hand him over to us and we'll deal with him. So Chris tells him, he said, I don't want him dead. He said, Chris, this is out of your hands now. This is in gangster's hand. We're going to deal with this the way we deal with things. And you got to understand that. He said, this is the lifestyle that you chose. This is a part of that lifestyle that you did not know about that most people don't know about. So Chris looks at his pops, his pops looks at him. And he says, son, I told you, this lifestyle has a lot of twists and turns to it. 
that you don't know about. And it can get ugly. And this is one example of it. This is one example of it. You don't get to make mistakes in this lifestyle and walk away too many times and survive. And this is one of those situations. And we got to find out if Sean had permission to do what he did. And he said, how are we going to find out? And Chris's pops looked at it and he said quite bluntly, he said, you're going to have to find out. You've been keeping everything else secret. He said, now you're going to have to keep this secret and manipulate Sean into telling you what's really going on. Period. Because until we know that, until we know that, we don't know what the next move is going to be. We get, so we got to find that out. So Sean tells him, he said, okay. He said, uh, the BM asked me, he said, how do you communicate with him? He said, I called him. He said, when was the last time you talked to him? He said, a couple of days ago. I told him I was sick of this. He said, well, give him a call. And we want to listen. We want to hear what's being said. Because we need to know. Because before I make the next move, I got to be sure about what I'm about to do. So Chris gets on the phone and he calls him. And the BM is looking. He's watching the number that he touches on the rotary dial. Now, keep in, the day, keep in mind, this back in the day, y'all, the rotary phone. Some of y'all don't know about that rotary phone. So he's making the call. The BM is uh, remembering the number that he dialed, right? Because the shenanigans is about to go down. You feel me? So everything about Sean now is being kept in the memory bank. So he calls Sean. He gets him on the phone, right? And the BM is standing right beside Chris, and they got the receiver between their ears, and they're both listening. And Chris tells him, he said, man, we need to talk. So Sean was like, about what? He said, man, I'm tired of doing what you got me doing, coming down here getting this information. He said, man, I want out. He said, how do I get out? The vice lord, go on with my life. He said, you can't get out of vice lord. There ain't no getting out of vice lord. He said, well, I'm going to tell everybody what's going on. And that's when Sean broke down like a, a a coward and told him, he said, man, if you do that, they going to kill me. So Chris said, what you mean they going to kill you? He said, won't nobody know. If I just leave, if you let me go, won't nobody know. I promise I won't say nothing. He said, it don't work that way. He said, I bought you into this. I bought you into this. They going to wonder. What's going on? So Sean asked him with the prompting from the BM, so do they know what I'm doing? And Sean said, no, nah, don't nobody know what you're doing but me. He said, so they didn't tell you to do this to me? He was like, no, nah, I was doing it for myself. I was trying to make sure that I could move up in the ranks. He gives the whole story up. He spills the beans. So BM is listening to it. He starts to nod his head. And he has this menacing smile coming across his face. And Chris is looking at him like, dying. It's almost like the BM is enjoying what he's hearing. Even though Chris is happy that the information is coming out, it, he doesn't feel the same kind of elation and joy that the BM is feeling. And that's when he realizes, I'm not cut out for this. I'm not cut out for this. Now, Lisa and Chris's pop, they're looking. And they can't hear, they can hear the mumbling, but they can't make out all the words. But from what the reaction that the BM is showing, Chris's pops is like, okay, everything's going to work out. So him and Lisa standing there hugged up, looking at each other, you know what I'm saying? And thinking about how bad this is going to be, not really understanding what's going to happen. And then the BM gets off the phone and lets Chris continue to talk. And he tells Lisa and Chris's pops, he said, I've heard of no. He said, he's going to be straight, but he's going to get some bumps and bruises, but we're going to get dude. So Chris's pops asked the BM, he said, what you getting ready to do now? He said, I'm going to have a sit down with the vice lord. The heads, we're going to talk. He said, but first I got to go back to the board and let them know what's going on with Chris. He said, Chris going to have to pay with his skin, but it's going to be all right. He said, everything's going to work out all right. So Chris is still on the phone yelling. Now he's yelling back and forth. So 
He said, man, I'm gone. I'll talk to you later. He hangs up the phone. And he's pissed off about everything that's happening because he's starting to see now how he was used and manipulated to the utmost. Used and manipulated to the fullest. So when he gets off the phone and, and he looks at he looks at the BM, the BM said, look, I'm going to go have a meeting and I'm going to get back with you. He said, but until then, man, you're on the GD arrest. You don't leave the house. Don't go nowhere. Don't talk to anybody. Now, Chris had never heard this language before, right? He said, what is GD arrest? He said, man, look here. I'm going to break this down for you. I might be able to save your life, but I ain't going to be able to save your hide. He said, when I report this, we're going to take care of it. He said, but it might cost you some bumps and bruises, man. He said, can you handle that? He said, check that. You ain't got no choice. He looked at Chris's pops. He said, man, look, I hate that it happened like this, but this might be the best thing. And he walked out. Now, Chris is spooked. He don't understand what's going on. So the BM, he pulls off. He leaves, right? About 20, 30 minutes later, another car pulls up. It's two of the gangsters. Now, they sitting outside the house. Don't come to the door to knock on the door or nothing. They just sit there. Chris tries to come out the door. He's standing on the porch. One of the gangsters get out of the car. He said, Chris, go back in the house. You can't come out. You're on the GD arrest. So it got real for him real fast. Folks of them sitting outside the house, he can't go nowhere. And if they do, they're going to get him. The investigation is on. The report is being made. Decisions are being made about his life that he has no control over. It ain't nothing that he could do or say about what's going to happen to him next. He's laid it all out. And the BM, the person that he's come to trust and look up to like a father, is going to be making decisions about his life because that's how the lifestyle is. So after the BM, he meets with the rest of the board members and they all talk and they figure out what they want to do. And then they sit down and they talk with the device lords and figure out what they want to do, which is they're going to hand Sean over to the gangsters just to keep the war from happening. They're going to let, they're going to let the gangsters deal with it. They're going to let the gangsters deal with it. Not before they deal with it, though. Not before they deal with it. They bumped him up. I'm talking about when I say bumped him up, them vice lords, man, look here. I know gangsters get down too, right? But them vice lords, man, when it comes to betrayal, when it comes to betrayal, Woo. Man, look here. When they turned Sean over, man, he was already bumped up. And they said, do what you will, but you can't kill him. It's the only thing you can't do. You can't kill him. They said, we'll do that if it comes to that. You don't get to kill him. So they turned him over. They did their thing to him. Put him in the hospital. They got him in the hospital for weeks. Now they got to figure out what they're going to do with Chris. Now, Chris has been talking to his pops. He's been nervous this whole time, waiting, not going to school, not doing anything. He cannot leave the house. Cannot leave the house. They've been changing shifts in front of the house. The brothers have been keeping on up with him, not letting him come out. They're not talking to him. They're not doing anything. And he feels the coldness of the lifestyle for the first time. He's feeling it. And the decision comes down. And the decision is, Chris has got to go. And that's the problem with this lifestyle. Decisions will be made about your life that you cannot uh, have any input on. Yeah, he made a mistake, but he was tricked. But just because he reported that information back to Sean, he has to pay for that. Being tricked or not, it's not a defense when it comes to the streets. You got to pay. And Chris's pops knew that it was going to be rough. He knew that it was going to be rough because he had faced it before and he ran. But this time, he was there for his son, and he told him, he said, you can't run, not like me. He said, don't be a coward like I was. I didn't stand and face what I had coming. He said, I had no business dealing with them anyway. 
And he told Chris, it's just like you. You had no business dealing with them anyway. He said, if I would have been here, this would have never happened. If I wouldn't have ran like a coward, this would have never happened. Chris is looking at him and he's crying and he's telling him, he said, I can take it. So Chris, is, <laughs> Chris's pops looks at him and tells him, he says, son, you ain't got no choice. And see, that's how hard this life is. That's how hard this life is. You got to face some hard realities when you're dealing with uh, street life, gangsters. You got to, these, these gangs, you got to face some hard realities. So the day came that Chris is going to be put in violation. And the same people that were his friends, the same people that said that they would die for him or kill for him and do all these things for him and they had gotten to know him, they were the ones that were sent to put in the work. And during all of this time, he's been talking to Pam on the phone. And she's telling him she's going to stick with him. She's telling him she's going to stick with him, but she doesn't know what's going to happen. She doesn't know that they're about to hurt him. She doesn't know that her brother is in charge of what's about to happen to him. She doesn't know that. So when they get to the house, they pick him up. And they put him in the car. And the car, the people that have been sitting in front of the house, they follow behind him. And they take him to an abandoned warehouse. And when they get to the abandoned warehouse, it's brothers from everywhere in there. Brothers from everywhere in there. And they read the charges. And they call him an infiltrator. They call him an infiltrator. And they acknowledge the fact that he didn't know him. They, they, they acknowledge the fact that he was 13. But what they don't give him leeway for is for reporting that information back. He put the organization in jeopardy. Right or wrong, good or bad, he put the organization in jeopardy. And he had to pay. And his punishment was six minutes with six brothers. No cover. -up. He had to fight for his life. Because even though it was just a physical violation, anything could happen. He could get hit in the head too hard and fall down dead. So they set, so they surround him. He's, he's within a circle in a circle. And they rush him. And they beat him. And they beat him. And they beat him what felt like to Chris forever. And when the and when Pam's brothers yelled out, that's enough, they let up off of him. He lay there in his own blood. And they all walked away and left him. And that was it. Chris lay there in his own blood. Think about that. He lay there in his own blood. He struggles to get up, but he does. And now he has to walk all the way home, bruised and battered and bleeding. It was the longest walk of his life. And when he gets home, his mother and his father are waiting on the porch. They rush to help him. And once they get him into the house, and he sits down, Chris sits on the couch, and he cries. He cries because he's been beaten. But more than that, he cries because the people that he thought loved him had beat him within, a, within an inch of his life. And he didn't understand the fullness of it because in his mind, they tricked him. Sean had tricked him. And it was no forgiveness for that. They didn't let him slide. A knock on the door came. It was Pam. She rushed in and she saw him. And she started wiping the blood away from his face. But as she did, Chris's anger started to boil up within him. He had become a master of hiding how he really felt. And now without even realizing it, he started to mas masquerade and, and pretend that everything was okay, but in his heart, it wasn't okay. Chris wanted his lick back and he was gonna get it one way or another. 
This has been another episode of Doing Time with Joe. I'm your host, Joe Baker, and I say peace, y'all. I've been trying to breathe on the water. What? Yeah.